أناجي الحق في ليل لهي من أصدق النجوى وأدعو الله من قلب سليم يطلب التقوى أناجي الحق في ليل لهي من أصدق النجوى وأدعو الله من قلب سليم يطلب التقوى Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ahlan wa sahlan wa marhaban bikum. And welcome to another edition of Perspective. My name is Faisal Patel. Nzili Kazi wa Africa is a South African Sunny Times investigative journalist. He has won more than a dozen awards locally and internationally for his work. Nzili Kazi wa Africa is currently the chairperson of the Forum for African Investigative Reporters and sits on the board of the Global Investigative Journalism Network. He is also a musician, songwriter and producer and released a Deep House album, The Icon, in 2008. Imzili Kazi wa Africa has also released a tell-all memoir published by Penguin Books called Nothing Left to Steal, which reveals the details behind the 1.7 billion rand lease scandal between the then police commissioner Becky Tele and property tycoon Ru Shabangu, for which he was infamously arrested in 2010. And tonight, it's an absolute pleasure to have in studio with me Mzilikazi Wa Africa. Welcome to Perspective. Thank you for having me here. It's an absolute pleasure. Now, let's begin. What gave you the inspiration to write the book? Is the writing more a challenge than journalism? I think over the years, uh, I had like a lot of my friends and colleagues were arguing me and advising me to write a book because many people wanted to know what exactly is happening behind the scenes uh, whenever we are doing an investigation, writing a story. So uh, for years I've been avoiding that idea because writing a book is a very, it's a big challenge, you know. So until around December 2012, uh, I decided that let me do this, you know, because the issues like I had this lot of pressure. People say we want to know this, we want to know that. Uh, I started drafting uh, like the skeleton of the book in December, and I started writing it in January 2013, and then I ended over the manuscript in in May uh, 2014, and it was released on August uh, the fourth, which marks the four-year anniversary of my arrest. <laughs> okay, now. Obviously, like you're saying, it takes a lot of time, you're investigative journalist for the Sunny Times. How did you manage time-wise to accomplish writing the book and still working for the Sunny Times? I mean, being a normal journalist, it's already time-consuming. Being an investigative journalist is probably more time-consuming because of the, all the leads you need to check, all the documents you need to check. Time-wise, how did you manage to write the book? Um, I used to write mainly over the weekends and at night, you know. I'll... I come from work, like maybe take a rest, and then in the middle of the night you wake up and then yes. you start writing. And over the weekend, I spend most of the weekend at the office, more especially on Sunday when it's quiet, I will sit there and write from the office because they told me now I've got kids and yes. uh, they also need my attention. So I I think I sacrifice a lot of my time that, uh, and I also sacrifice a lot of time I was supposed to spend with my family just to finish writing this book. and. I'm very grateful for them. They didn't really get annoyed with me when I locked myself in my study room, in my room, or away in the studio writing this book. And uh, I think they know what exactly I was away doing because they very love the book. Now, speaking on that, and I was going to ask you, that was my next question with regards to that. Being a journalist, obviously, you need to go out at odd hours of the night. I know when I'm on a story and my wife normally chucks me out and says, you don't come home at 3 o'clock in the morning. How did your wife handle it? I mean, <laughs> did she put you out on the couch for the night or not? No, 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 no. <laughs> I always worked odd hours, you know. Even yes. my kids, they understand, you know, that... Uh, they might see me today, they might not see me for the next two, yes. two, three days or the next week or so. So whenever they see me, they're happy, they want to spend more time with me. But then when they see me, they're happy, they want to spend more time with me. And I'll say, oh, hang on, guys, I'm busy writing my book, which was like a very bad... Uh, but I think they understood what I was trying to do, and now they understand why I had to do what I did. Mm. Now, you've won many awards for your work. Looking back on your career, what do you think was your defining moment that made you a success? I mean, success is a collective 
yeah. you know i i worked with a great team like i'm still working with a great team you know Although yet your effort is needed, your your skills and your your ideas about the whole thing are needed in this thing. But uh, for me, I mean, the story for me that stands out in this whole uh, investigations that I've done all over the years, yes. the story when how I was beaten up and thrown in the middle of Kruger National Park, like my first my first week at the Sunday Times for me defined me like say. If I manage to survive and sustain that whole pressure and then survive being dumped in the middle of Kruger National Park after being beaten up and coming up with a good story, which uh, really paved the way for me to winning an award or two, it was great for me. It like gave me to, like, it became like a fuel I needed for to take my my car to the next de uh, destination. Yeah. Now. Coming on to the book, in, in one article uh, that you speak of the bankruptcy within the profession of journalism. It's not a financial one, but professional bankruptcy. Can you expound on that? I, I mean, uh, we have people, like we've got journalists who believe that Twitter and Facebook is, is journalism. Yes. You know, journalism, people believe that sitting on your desk the whole day and uh, um, it does journalism. I believe, I might be old school, I believe journalism is going out there in the field and uh, hunting for news, not waiting for someone to phone you and say, hey, I've got this for you, you know. I think, I'm not saying all journalists are lazy. I think we've got like more and more journalists becoming lazier, maybe because they're, they're more comfortable with whatever they're doing or because they're doing something completely different from what I'm doing. Yeah. You know, for me as an investigative journalist, I want to go out there to be on the field to, you know, you can't call yourself a hunter when you are just sitting in your, in your, in your like with your binoculars and a long uh, a range shot of yeah. gun shooting from it. You have to go out to the bush, you know. Sometimes you get the surprise of your life and all of that, but that's what makes hunting more exciting. Speaking on social media, we know that you've got Facebook, you've got Twitter and a whole lot of other media platforms as well. Would you agree that uh, social media, especially Twitter, plays a vital role in, in relaying something that might have broken or a story that have broken? And uh, I mean, most of the time, sometimes I script a, a news bulletin from, from what's happening on Twitter. Obviously, we would take it in, in uh, not as a matter of fact until the story has um, been verified, but would you agree that social media is playing a vital role in, in journalism these days? On my side, I, I don't, you know. <laughs> the point is, I'm on Twitter, I just put quotes and photos, that's <laughs> all I do. Uh, other people are there to, like, when I started, many people were frustrated because they were following me, expecting me, I'm going to tell them what I'm doing, what, what I'm investigating. I can't do that. I'm an investigative journalist, you know. I have to guard whatever I'm doing, I have to protect everything. So the best thing for me was to put codes and put photos and let people enjoy, you know, that. I also, I do get uh, uh, tips from Twitter, mm -hmm. but I don't follow a story that is already, because it's already out there, everyone knows about it. So yes. I rather try and come up with something new and something fresh. Okay. Now, speaking on the book, one extract of the book that intrigued me was when in 2003, the Sunny Times was eager to get its hands on the questions put to our president, Jacob Zuma, by the NPA or the National Prosecuting Authority in connection with the investigation into his corruption. Now, the Times crack investigative team couldn't get its hands on the document, so it turned to political reporter Ranjani Munsami, who was famously close to Zuma's camp at that particular time. Can you tell us what happened? Now, what really happened is, as stated in the book, we eventually got the questions and uh, how Ranjani got them, uh, she knows how she got them. It's, uh, she has to give a side of the story, but eventually we got this, uh, the questions from Zuma camp. We published them, and Zuma was all over the radio saying the Scorpions has leaked the question to us. Meanwhile, he knows exactly how we got the questions, which was for me was really it made me think twice about trusting a politician to do the right thing, you know when someone knowing exactly the truth but turns around and say complete opposite of what is the truth. We got the questions and then uh, Bulelan was later accused of being a spy. There was a heifer commission and was exonerated. And uh, by the same guys who tried to make him look like a spy and there were the same guys behind leaking the questions to the Sunday Times, which is, we didn't write the story because we realized that it was a hoax mm. kind, kind of, but the other, newspaper did and 
they had an egg on their face. Of, uh, the yes. Now, Ranjani did file a complaint to the press ombudsman contesting your account of events. Your comments on that? I think you have seen the outcome of the press ombudsman. She lost it. Yes, yes. So it means uh, the press uh, ombudsman read everything and realized that I was right. Okay, you tuned to Perspective. We're speaking to Mzili Kazi Wa Africa, and he's released a new book called Nothing Left to Steal. You should actually get it. It's absolutely brilliant. We're going to go for a break. After the break, we're going to be continue speaking to Mzili Kazi Wa Africa. Stay tuned to Perspective. أصدق النجوى وأدعو الله من قلب سليم يطلب التقوى إلهي صرت في ظرف عصيب فاكشف البلوى فيا ربي Welcome back to Perspective. This evening we're speaking to Mzili Kazi Wa Africa. He's a Sunny Times investigative journalist and he's also written a book uh, called Nothing Left to Steal. If you can have a look at that on your screen, absolutely brilliant, brilliant book. You should get one out and read it. Explain South African politics and all the stories behind South African politics. Now, Mzili Kazi, before, Mzili Kazi, before the break, we were speaking about uh, journalists and sources. The one question that's always been bugging me, the relationship between a journalist and a source is one of trust because he's giving you a lot of important, pertinent information. What happens when the source breaks that bond. And I want you to refer specifically to Agent RS-452. Yes, uh, you see, for me, a source is someone that comes to you, giving you very uh, good information, and someone who must not lie to you. The problem, my problem is, once a source starts lying to you, that, that relationship uh, ends there, because you, he comes to you, he or she comes to you, to give you information and says to you, please protect my identity and no one must know I've been speaking to you. But when you find out that your source has been using you, abusing your trust, then there's no the same thing as like in a relationship. When you find out that your partner is cheating on you, it's mm -hmm. been lying to you, yes. then it becomes a problem. I think that's the same thing should uh, uh, happen with the sources. We should, by all means as journalists, protect our sources. We should be prepared to go to jail just to protect the identity of our sources. But when your source starts lying to you, mm -hmm. I don't think he or she deserves any protection from you. Okay, now speaking on that, um, I want to elaborate on that, that particular point. Um, we're speaking about the whole questions that was, Bulelani Nguka was uh, considered the spy, RS 452. Mm -hmm. You went to great lengths to find out who actually was this the spy. Mm -hmm. uh, without, obviously, as much as you can disclose, how did you go about tracking this particular person? Um, you see, when we find out that there was this number, you know, mm -hmm. you know, remember there was a whole file of but who actually everyone was given a particular number. Mm -hmm. So I had to ask a friend of mine who works, who still works for the national intelligence. I said, I've got this number, I need to find out who actually is this person. Mm -hmm. And my friend later came back to me and said, it's a woman. Um, She's a white woman, but I don't know her identity right now, but I'm working on it. And later, weeks later, I came back to him with her number and the full name and said, this way she is, phone her, and I called her now. Uh, husband at first answered the phone, and then, sec and then I spoke to the husband, and I said, I need to speak to your wife. I said, what is it about? I said, this is personal, you know? Mm -hmm. I said, but this, she's my wife. So, so I explained to the husband that I'm a journalist from South Africa. I want to interview your wife about this. And he was, I don't know what I shocked, but there was some silence a little bit on the phone. And uh, he let her look, okay, fine, let me ask her. She came on the phone, she was crying, probably briefed her. And uh, she talked to me off the record and asked me not to reveal her, which I did after speaking to her. I didn't write any story until when it all came out and everyone started writing who she is and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But for me, it was to verify whether or not Bulelane was a spy whether or not who actually was that spy with that particular number. Okay. We know that, I mean, since the, the dawn of democracy in South Africa, uh, the ruling party has now been ruling for almost 20 years. Um, I'm sure most of your tip-offs have come within uh, the government. If these people are willing to betray maybe their bosses or their superiors, the information that they hand to you, how do you test that particular information? 
You see, uh, there are so many ways to 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 test uh, information. Like any document, you know, mm -hmm. might be written by one person. It was sent to one or two other people. You know, you have to go and try and to the next person and say, "Did you ever receive this jet, this document? I show this the right document." Mm -hmm. You know, all of that. You know, and also if there was a meeting where certain things were said, you ask some of the people who were there at that meeting to say, were you at this meeting? Did you hear this person saying A, B, C, D, and all of that, you know? That's, that's more or less like that, you know, because whatever happened, unless it's a, it's a bribe, you know, a bribe most cases happens between two people, you know, unless the other party starts squealing about it, that's when you can verify it. Absolutely. So, yeah. Okay, normally when a, a story comes onto the front page of the Sunday Times, um, I mean, people are under the impression that maybe you work on a story today and it only comes printed on a Sunday. How long does a proper huge story, a, let's take a scandal, uh, we'll come to the others we're going to discuss a little bit later, but if you have to take a big story that comes on the front page of the Sunday Times, how much investigative work is that? How long does it take? See, to doing an investigation takes a long, long time and sometimes it frustrates your boss because your boss is sitting there, he knows you're working on this fantastic story and he's expecting it this week, next week or so. Uh, like for example, the list story, we got the first document in April and mm -hmm. the first story was written on the 1st of August. Uh, the Tony and Gany investigation, we started that investigation I think the first week of December. And the story came up on 21st of March. So you can see how many months it took us to conclude and verify, uh, meet people and all of that. So it, basically we always say to the boss, sorry boss, wait, you know, good things come to those who wait. You know, just wait a bit, you'll get a good story. Absolutely. Mm. Now, you and your colleague Stephen Hofstetter broke a story exposing the former National Police Commissioner Becky Taylor in a 1.7 billion rand property lease scandal. You were arrested on the 4th of August 2010 for that story. From the beginning, tell us what happened. Tell the day you got arrested. You see, April, a friend of mine called me and said, I've got this, I think there were about four pages. Mm -hmm. uh, someone said, I must give you these four pages. And uh, I look at that, it was like part of the, the police saying, we need to move into this building before the World Cup and uh, all of that, you know. And it was signed off by the former commissioner. Um, we started trying to find out the building exactly who owns it and like how was it paid, how good or bad is it and what is wrong with the, the current uh, police building, the Wachstadt. Uh, 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 yes. So all of that, but in between, remember it was the World Cup and I was in the middle of another investigation in Pumalanga. At the time I was spending more time in Pumalanga doing a another complete investigation. Yeah. So in between the, that investigation, and I'll try and phone around, okay. get more details, and also, also Stefan was busy with something else. So by the end of the World Cup, that's when we said, now mm -hmm. we've, we've done the groundwork, now let's just uh, concentrate on this one. And, uh, and we, after we were sure of our story, we phoned the former National Commissioner, we said, yeah, but yeah, you signed this lease and all of that, you know. That's when the whole story came to shape and uh, it was published on the 1st of August and uh, three days later I was arrested and uh, I was taken to Mpumalanga. The case was uh, with uh, letter withdrawn and I sued the state successfully and uh, yeah. And for me again, I was not suing the state because of the money. For me, it was a matter of principles. That's what I have to sue because I needed to clear my name. I wanted the minister of police to con to admit in black and white that my arrest was wrongful and un unlawful, and which he did at the end, and that's what I was looking for. Okay, now being an investigative journalist, obviously there's a whole lot of perils that come with it as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're in a limelight, um, you might not be on radio and television, but obviously you're on the front page of the Sunday Times possibly every week. Has you or your family been even put in a precarious or a dangerous situation? Okay, you yourself have been kidnapped, you, they've taken you to Mpumalanga. In one of the excerpts of the books, you even had a gun shoved in your mouth, you, you're going to mention. But your family and your kids... Um, you see, that's one thing, you know, there were times when like uh, maybe in, uh, in 2010, when we like, I had like a um, lock, uh, security guards at my family 24 hours, you know, mm -hmm. um, and again, as 
this is not just because I'm a journalist. Anyone who can afford it, you need to have like precaution, uh, security at your house, like your cameras. That's what I have at my house and try to build a high wall and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So I do have cameras, I do have high wall. And uh, again, I don't think that's safe enough, but that's the best I can, I can afford and I can do for my family. Okay. And also let teach your kids to see if you see something suspicious or someone is ringing the bell, you don't know the person, yes. don't open the, you know, all those uh, things you need to let your kids know about that, you know. Okay, we just got a little over two minutes left. Um, at the beginning of your, each chapter of your book, uh, there are quotes. My favorite is, if you think that you are too small to make a difference, you haven't spent a night with a mosquito. What inspired these quotes and how did you uh, select them? See, most uh, like all of the quotes come from the books I've been reading over the years, you know, mm -hmm. and some of the uh, I love uh, I love reading, and uh, and then that quote specifically that you just said comes is one of the African proverbs. Mm -hmm. I read a lot of African proverbs because for me it uh, it so guides you to understanding certain things, you know, mm -hmm. the way we're coming from, like cultural and traditional, you know. Um, so I love quotes, and uh, when I was writing this book, I said, what are some of the quotes that inspired me in my life? You know, some of the quotes that I came across while I was in my line of duty or while I was reading or going through the net, you know. So, and then I put together some of the quotes that somehow, somehow changed my life yes. here and there or opened my eyes, and I hope they will do the same, touch people who are reading my book and open their eyes okay. as well. Okay, just in a minute, um, your uh, sort of last comments to our viewers and where they can get hold of uh, this book, uh, which is called Nothing Left to Steal? So this book is uh, available uh, at all uh, bookshops nationwide. It's also available on, on Kindle. It's also available on Amazon, on Kalahari. So is this available even if you're out of the country, you can get it online. And if you happen to, buy, to go to the mall, you can go to your exclusive book, to your CNA you'll get the book is there, um, which for now I'm happy because the support I've been getting, you know, the book is currently uh, one of the top 10 best-selling books in South Africa, which is, is very good. I'm a first-time author and getting the support that I'm getting from there. I'd just like to thank everyone who has bought my book and people who are talking about it. Zilika Ziwa Africa, thank you so much for your time. Much appreciated and all the best with your book. Thank you very much for having me this evening. Unfortunately, that's uh, the end of this week's episode of Perspective. Join me again next week. From my team and myself, Fia Manila, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. <laughs> سليم يطلب التقوى أناجي الحق في ليل بهيم أصدق النجوى وأدعو الله من قلب سليم يطلب التقوى إلهي صرت في ظرف عصيب فاكشف البلوى فيا رب